Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm so excited. This is going to be one of my favorite my favorite topics and one of my favorite lectures. I'm going to just give you a background for synthesis. And this is both for my organic 1 2323 and my organic 2 2325. I want to take just 10 or 15 minutes to actually do a background for synthesis. It is such a huge topic in organic chemistry and it has such a direct effect on our everyday lives that I think it's worth taking 10 or 15 minutes to explain the history behind synthesis and why in the world we give a crap. And of course, I have to use my sparkle pen. Um, it's synthesis, it's my background, it's my favorite, and I'm so excited to share some of that with you. Oh, this is not gonna be a comprehensive background. Like I said, I just wanna do 10 or 15 minutes just to get us acquainted, and it's just kind of fun. I'd like to start our journey actually back in Gen Chem 1. So I don't know what your Gen Chem experience was like, but that very first Gen Chem 1, we tend to do a little bit of history. And that history directly ties in to synthesis. There's a few things in here that I just want to do a quick timeline of our Gen Chem 1 and just kind of remind you because there's some really interesting arguments that happened and a whole lot of science came out of that. So let's go all the way back to... 1600s, this is when we made the transition from alchemy to chemistry. Uh, this was actually giving credit to Robert Boyle of Boyle's Law that we know from our gas laws in Gen Chem 1 or respiration in your bio classes. Uh, he was actually fascinated by gases in the 1600s. And in fact, he published a book in 1661 called The Skeptical Chemist. And that book was what most chemists give credit to making the transition from alchemy to chemistry. And basically what he did was he didn't look at science as pure magic anymore. He actually looked at it as a systematic approach of studying a problem. And it sounds so silly today, you know, several hundred years later, but that was actually a pretty big transition. Take one question and just study the heck out of it. And then what, where I like to start in Gen Chem is electricity because it's actually um, pretty fascinating and a whole lot of science and physics and chemistry came out of the study for electricity. And a whole lot of, a lot of people don't realize the history behind it. We all learned in grade school, Benjamin Franklin, 1776, lightning as electricity with the kite and the key, and we all have that picture burned into our brain. Um, but then what we didn't realize is then the fun part started with biology. Uh, a, an Italian physician, Galvani, he was actually interested in physics and electricity. And once the discovery was made that lightning is electricity, he was actually quite uh, fascinated by what that had to do with biology and physiology. So he did a famous experiment called the Galvani frog. And he literally took a frog up on the rooftop and he, he hooked electrodes to it and he waited for lightning. Um, and it's super exciting because if you look at modern literature at the time, this is where Frankenstein comes from. So all of those, those ideas at the time they were coming from the galvani frog and what he what he noticed was that muscles actually interacted with electricity they got a little jolt in your muscle tissue when they sparked with electricity um and this sparked this whole idea <laughs> get it oh man i gotta use the sparkle pen for that uh, this sparked a whole controversy where this was now called animal electricity. It wasn't understood yet, but they thought, oh, dang it, let's spell it right. Okay. All right, animal electricity. So the idea was that there's got to be something in tissue in human bodies and animal bodies in bodies that interacts with electricity. And if it interacts with electricity, maybe it is electricity. So there was an idea floating around for a number of years, animal electricity, but it had to be in living things. And then Volta came along in the 1800s and actually had the first cell, the first chemical reaction produce electricity. And this blew everybody out of the water because now you could have a 
chemical reaction produce electricity? Well, hang on a second. If electricity, what the heck is it and where do you find it? So this is now a big controversy that animal electricity and chemical electricity must be two completely different things. And honestly, that question was not solved for almost 100 years. And this is what's fascinating in our history is that we went all the way through 100 years of fascination with electricity before we ever knew what it was. And that's awesome. So if we look at our history, now that we've got electricity, Humphrey Davy went to town with chemistry and electricity and discovered electrolysis. And he went and took table salt, zapped it with a current and made sodium and chlorine. Of course, he was addicted to nitrous. So his driving force was actually to, in to form gases and inhale them and see if he could make a better nitrous. Um, and he also started blowing up his lab. So he had to get <laughs> the university forced him into getting a, a young worker with him uh, to try to keep him somewhat safe while he was doing his experiments. And that young person was perhaps more famous than Humphrey Davy himself, and that was Michael Faraday. He came up with the first generator while working under Humphrey Davy. And this is pretty fascinating because now chemists, physicists, biologists, physicians, they could all actually get their hands on electricity. So pretty soon you'll see throughout our history, electricity, holy crap. You know, by the 1880s, Edison was able to power an entire city, New York City. And I just wanna point out that at this point, nobody had any idea what electricity was. It still hadn't actually been discovered. And if we look at this timeline right in here, I just wanna pause for organic chemistry for a second. Look at this 50 year gap here. Okay, we didn't actually discover an electron until 1897. That is a hundred years later that an actual electron was discovered from these first experiments right here with electricity. It's a hundred years it took them to figure out what that was. Let's put in a little organic chemistry in here. A lot of this you guys have already heard. So let's put in, aha, the plot thickens. <laughs> and then we'll come right back up. Let's put in a famous organic chemist, Frederick Wohler. Look at that year, 1828. So if we look at our history, that is before even the first generator. He was able to take and synthesize urea. But here's the kicker. He synthesized urea from an inorganic compound. He did not synthesize from a living object. So a lot of people in organic synthesis think that Frederick Wohler was actually the father of all of organic synthesis because way back in 1828, he was literally in on this controversy of, holy crap, do you have things that have to come from living tissues, living animals, plants, animals, tissue? Or do you have things that are completely not from a living source? And there was a huge divide and nobody knew uh, the difference between that two divided areas of chemistry that will turn into organic and inorganic chemistry for chemists. So it was pretty interesting that he actually had the first synthesis and he formed something that we all know comes from a living species, only he made it from something not living. So he was indeed part of this whole controversy. He wanted no part of it. He just sort of published his facts and he let people argue for the next hundred years <laughs> on what synthesis really meant. And if that could be the same substance that came from a living species. So let's fast forward real quick through some of our, just to point out some of our history. The electron didn't come until, check this out, 70 years after the first synthesis, uh, 70 years. Wohler didn't even know what an electron was. Nobody even knew what an atom looked like and he was able to synthesize urea. It wasn't until 20 years later, Ernest Rutherford published that idea of the nuclear atom and the proton. I mean, we didn't even know what a proton was until 1917. That is almost a hundred years. 
after Wohler synthesized urea. Um, and then, of course, 1927 and 1932 until we got an actual picture of the atom. So that's a solid 100 years after the first organic synthesis. So I've included in here Wohler's famous comment and why people give him credit for being the father of organic chemistry. He had a famous, famous quote for, I cannot, so to speak, hold my chemical water and must tell you that... I can make urea without need of kidney or even an animal, be it man or dog. So it seems kind of crazy. Oop, let's add a space in there so I don't have a line there. Not sparkle pen, not sparkle pen. Okay, never mind. Pretend there's a space there. Okay. So after that, I, I included a nice um, link here for you, a chemistry in a chemistry link. I'm gonna post this file on Blackboard so you have access to all these links. I've got a million links in the next page. So this, this is really where people feel like synthesis started and how you can make something that comes from a living organism like urea, but you can start from something that did not come from a living organism. And this is pretty incredible. Um, so take a look at that link. It kind of shows his process and in, in his life. And that really started some pretty huge changes and huge ideas in pharmaceuticals. So by the mid-1800s, a major shift after Wohler's synthesis of urea, major shift happened. You know, people have been using medicines for thousands of years. They've been taking plants and using plants as medicines for an awful long time. We'll look at the story of aspirin in a minute, and that has been known since 400 BC. But by the mid-1800s, pharmaceuticals now weren't just coming from botanicals. Now there was an avenue to synthesize drugs so things could be made. Now let's pause for a second and let's just talk OCHEM 1 definition. And that is that we know now that they are the same thing. But at the time, they didn't. We didn't know that until about the 1950s with Linus Pauling. So back in the mid-1800s, now you could get your hands on drugs, not just from plants. You could make them. So pharmacies all over the place started compounding and making different drugs coming from, from chemicals. Uh, a huge leader in that industry by the late 1800s, really you could almost think of one of the first pharmaceutical companies, and that is going to be uh, Bayer actually. So in the late 1880s in Germany, a whole lot of actual just rudimentary basic organic synthesis to make drugs. So I included a couple links here. Please check them out. I know they're Wikipedia, but there's still a lot of good information out there. They're just for fun. They give a little history of the pharmaceutical industry and the history of organic synthesis in the mid 1800s. For us in the U.S., this kind of kicked off our FDA. Our FDA started in the early 1900s, and I included a nice timeline with the FDA. If you're fascinated at all, it is really interesting. It's just a paragraph, but it goes through the evolution of the FDA over time and the changes that are made in the FDA. To give you an example, of some of those changes and well let's let's back up a second let me give you the story of of aspirin actually and and kind of tell you why we even give a crap about any of this so by the 1880s they're starting to make drugs and there's still a controversy if things coming from inorganic substances are actually the same thing or organic or not all they knew is that this stuff worked so something like aspirin let's take a minute so the story of aspirin is really fascinating. It's been around and it's been taken and it's been known since 400 BC. Can you believe that? Keeping along our timeline, the first synthesis of aspirin, it was arguably one of the first mainstream drugs that we know of today that was synthesized way back then. 1853 was the first synthesis of, of aspirin. And then by 1890, Bayer was cranking out aspirin and distributing worldwide. Uh, pretty fascinating. Again, keep in mind, they didn't even know what an electron was yet, but they were cranking out the aspirin. 
let's fast forward just a second and let's ask us why we give a crap. <laughs> we give a crap for a couple reasons. Reason number one, 10 million people a day in the U.S. alone take an aspirin. All right, the original aspirin comes from the bark of a willow tree. So just hold on a second and let's just do the math on that. If you were to take and need to supply just the U.S., you're pushing a billion a day to actually service the planet. But if we're looking at just the U.S. and you need 10 million people taking an aspirin a day, how many trees do you think you would need to actually supply that aspirin? It would be a staggering amount. It wouldn't be possible. So in the world we live in today, there are two main questions. One, is it the same thing? So if something is coming from the lab versus nature, is it the same thing? Thanks to Linus Pauling in the 1950s, what makes a compound that compound is which atoms are connected to which atoms and in what shape. That is it. It does not matter if it's coming from nature or coming from the lab. They are the exact same thing if they have the same structure and the same shape. So if you're looking to actually supply your planet with aspirin, synthesizing versus taking the tree bark from a willow tree uh, is certainly the better option. And this is where organic synthesis has grown in 100 years to be a prolific, prolific industry. So I included some links here for salicylic acid and the aspirin kind of background just for fun. It's pretty interesting. I'd like to point out that in the world we live in today, over 80% of our drugs are actually coming from natural products, but they are sourced from all over the place. So some are sourced from natural products like cocaine can be synthesized or can be taken from nature. It depends on the plant, the tree, the source, how fast can you grow it, where, you know, how much can you grow. Um, certainly CBD oil is in the news, hemp is in the news, that is grown and synthesized. It's got two, two sources, just depends how much you're trying to get your hands on. Uh, to keep up with this evolution for 100 years, the FDA has have to evolve with it. So um, some, some notable examples that I use in my OCHEM 1 class, by the 1960s, thalidomide was a known product that was given to pregnant mothers for nausea. It had two stereo centers. There was an R and an S. One was active. The other caused major birth defects. And so, you know, the FDA had to evolve with this one. Uh, so you'll see on the, the FDA timeline, it has had to constantly evolve every number of years to include as science evolves with it. So for organic chemistry, can you believe it wasn't until the 1960s that actually people really understood and cared about stereo centers? They had an idea that they were out there. They didn't really know what they meant. Um, and we know now today that that shape matters. I mean, one enantiomer has one active property, the other enantiomer can have no activity or it can have completely different activity. So it's kind of interesting. Take a look at that FDA timeline for that. It's pretty fun. So modern day organic synthesis was really started after that. So really after the 1960s, when we started really approaching synthesis, thinking in in terms of, okay, hang on a second. There's a lot of biologically active compounds. We have a huge population. How do we target those biologically active compounds and make enough and not have to get them from nature, but also keep in mind what we now know about structure and organic chemistry. By the 60s and 70s, organic structures were getting pretty solid. Certainly by the 1980s and 1990s, with the um, NMR and X-ray crystallography, now structures are really known uh, for organic chemistry. So synthesis is taken on a whole new level.
Uh, just a couple more minutes. If you're interested in OCHEM 1, we talk about the, the Taxol synthesis on our very first day. That gives a really awesome picture of modern day organic synthesis. I'll give you a quick, just a quick highlight of why we study synthesis in organic chemistry. Taxol itself came from a Pacific yew tree. It has been known from a Harvard botanist um, in the 60s, and it was known to have anti-tumor, anti-cancer uh, properties back in the late 1960s uh, as a natural product. It was kind of put on the shelf for a little while. By the 1980s, they started studying it and realizing that it had an effect specifically on breast cancer. Now I'm giving the abbreviated tale of the story, it's quite large. So by the 1990s, they wanted to target our Taxol as a drug. The problem is, is that the Taxol structure itself is quite huge. It is quite huge. And if I'm not mistaken, there are at least or up to 17 stereocenters in that sucker. So knowing what you know now, trying to put that molecule together in a synthesis turned out to be quite a beast. It took an awful long time. In fact, uh, the first synthesis out there came from Florida. That synthesis was 51 synthetic steps in the lab. 51 steps, holy crap. So obviously that is fairly inaccessible. And let's just, let's compare that to taking it from the Pacific yew tree itself instead of making it in the lab. In order to go through the first round of FDA trials, they did use the natural Pacific yew tree. They used the Taxol from there. To make it through only the first round of trials took 3,000 trees. So, Again, do the math on that. If you want that to be a, a medicine that can actually be used globally, it's not possible to actually isolate enough from a tree and actually grow enough trees. Their maturity rate is quite long from what I understand. And then the synthesis itself, holy crap, <laughs> that's terrible. If I'm not mistaken, by the 2000s, uh, they were able to isolate a plant that grew a flower that was very fast and very quick and they could take that flower and the synthesis past the flower that they were able to grow was only 21 steps. And that is how they get Taxol today. Now, a lot of that is trademarked, so I may not know the most current uh, methods for that for Taxol, but definitely check out that synthesis story. It, it really describes what a lot of drugs go through in their process and why it's really important to think about organic and synthesis. Um, it's pretty cool. And then, of course, I have to throw in just a little bit of modern with synthesis. Did you know that there are over 20,000 today FDA-approved drugs? This is coming right from the FDA website itself if you want to check it out. And then um, I have to just put a little bit of doom and gloom on there. Recently, in the last couple of years, uh, some of those FDA drugs have been outsourced to different countries like China. And then by the time those drugs are coming back, most notably a heart med has been in the news in the last two years that the process has been altered in China while they're making the drugs. And by the time they come back to the US, they have a different profile and they've been causing problems. So there are good and bad to that whole story. But I hope you're at least getting an idea of why we even care in organic chemistry about synthesis. Um, my background is a pharmaceutical industry, so all of this is really exciting for me, but Mother Nature does an amazing job at really targeting different systems in the body, so taking advantage of that is perfectly natural for organic chemistry, and then turning around and providing a synthesis to those actual compounds um, is just a natural step for chemistry because they're they're quite needed as you can see from nature we can't always you know wipe out a country and grow only one kind of tree there and have that actually provide enough aspirin globally 
for what our needs are. So I hope this is kind of fun. This was fun for me. Um, I hope it wasn't too long, but I wanted to give you a little bit of history. And so stay tuned. My next video will be how to actually do synthesis in our organic one class and in our organic two class. I'll have a nice video on where